Madam President, in recent days, much has been said about Afghanistan. I spoke about it last time, September 15th. Most of my colleagues have spoken on the very same subject. I come to speak more about it. Today, I will look at it from a very different angle. I'm going to look at it from the angle that you see through the Inspector General lens. The sudden collapse of the Afghan government and the Afghan army drew me right back to years of oversight work and audits conducted by the Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction. Now, the terminology Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction goes by the acronym SIGAR. That person goes by the name of his real name, Mr. John Sopko. SIGAR and its reports pulled no punches report after report over the years, exposed and documented grim allegations of weak security, systemic corruption, and waste, waste of taxpayers' dollars. Those core problems were brushed aside and allowed to eat away at the foundation of our commitment. In other words, our leaders were not heeding the warnings from the Inspector General, Mr. John Sapka. An inability to solve these problems prompted Segar to send warning signals. Those warning signals said our mission in Afghanistan was failing. And that's not a recent conclusion. That's things he stated over and over, over the years. And this was all to the detriment of U.S. foreign policy and our national security, the fact that most Segar's advice fell on deaf ears. Segar was like a lone wolf howling out there in the wilderness as the final scene of the Afghan tragedy unfolded, as we all saw on television at the Kabul airport. In those circumstances, President Biden cut and run. He assigned blame scare, squarely on the Afghans' shoulders. But that's not the whole truth. Just pick up any cigar report. It's plain to see in those reports that something were, was wrong. We were the chief architect and financer, financier for the lion's share of this construction in Afghanistan that collapsed. If we're, if we're to learn from this experience, we need to begin by looking in the mirror. Segar's quote unquote lessons learned reports clearly indicate that security against the Taliban threat was a top priority. According to Segar, security was never achieved. Based on repeated assessments of the Army's readiness, Segar concluded that the Afghan army lacked the capability to independently defend the country against internal and external threats. Contrary to President Biden's hailing the capability of the Afghan military to preserve the country and defend it from the Taliban. And without security, nation building was a non-starter. Now we question whether or not nation building ought to be part of the policy, but it seemed to be too often. 
when coupled with the systemic corruption I just mentioned, and Cigar characterized that as an existential threat that eroded Army's readiness, prospects for survival of the government and the Army of Afghans doing their job were very dim. Against advice that I've given previous administrations, the President announced the date certain for putting out, pulling out the U.S. military. And by the way, that wasn't wise because you never tell your enemies what your plans are. So within days, the Taliban eliminated the Afghan army with hardly a struggle. The Taliban then seized U.S. military assets. The Biden administration left Americans and Afghan allies behind enemy lines, adding tragedy to the deeply flawed military exit. A U.S. drone strike killed 10 civilians. There's clear and present urgency for accountability. Do my fellow senators pay appropriate attention to the work of the IGs throughout government? Maybe not often enough, but sure in listening to Cigar, not enough of us listen to him. Afghans, Afghanistan's collapse underscores the merits of Cigar's work out of three dozen confirmed IGs. IGs do important work, and their work should be considered greatly, and the fact that we ignored Cigar's work in Afghanistan is a tragedy, particularly when the people in the executive branch of government ignored it. Cigar was created to watchdog the huge sums of money pouring into the Afghanistan. Mr. Sopko, the IG, did his job well. He issued aggressive, hard-hitting reports documenting egregious waste and blatant cor corruption on both sides, our side and the Afghan side. Large sums of money simply disappeared. In a recent report, Seagar served up a classic case of waste and corruption, and he did it on a silver platter. It is symptomatic of the rot that derailed our efforts in Afghanistan. It, one example, it involved the purchase of 20 refurbished Italian G-222 medium lift aircraft for the Afghan Air Force. They added $549 million to the taxpayers' tab. These aircrafts were needed but unsupportable and inoperable. The squandering on this project was matched by others exposed by Seagar, like the 64,000 square foot Surge Command Center that was built for $34 million but never needed and never occupied. The G-222, I should say 222 aircraft, was just another notch in un Uncle Sam's belt of wasteful spending. Those planes were thrown in the junk heap because of crooked mismanagement, and that was on our side. The Air Force General, who led the program while on active duty, and then as vice president for the company selling the Italian aircraft, allegedly violated criminal conflict of interest statutes. Seagar wanted to pursue, pursue criminal charges, but the Department of Justice refused to prosecute. 
the Department of Justice turned a blind eye to the general's alleged misconduct. Let that sink in. A half billion dollar taxpayer's dollars went up in smoke and no one was held to account. At a minimum, this reckless spending demanded disciplinary action. With little or no accountability, it was easy for crooks to line their pockets with schemes like the G-222 aircraft. Now, Seaguard exposed that. It wasn't prosecuted, but Seaguard nailed quite a few. Investigations resulted in 160 criminal convictions. Corruption was found on both sides. The convicted included 42 Afghans, 58 U.S. military personnel, 49 U.S. contractors, and 11 U.S. government personnel and citizens. Some money was recovered, but obviously you don't recover all of it. However, in such a target-rich environment, I suspect that CIGAR's investigators barely scratched the surface. Unfortunately, while CIGAR's finger was stuck in the dike, Uncle Sam kept spending money, kept the spigot wide open. Some estimate that over $2 trillion flowed through the pipe to, the, to a government and an army known by Seagar to be riddled with sy systemic corruption. We tolerated it, and the money kept flowing. What happened in Afghan Afghanistan boils down to the fundamental principle of good government. Oversight is critical to accountability. Seagar has more work to do. Seagar will need to provide a full accounting for all the captured and abandoned weapons and equipment. You see a figure of $85 billion of that stuff left over there for the Taliban to use for whatever they want to use it for. Hopefully never against the United States. The IG will need to track down unexpended dollars in the pipeline, estimated at six and a half billion or more, so those tax dollars can be returned to the Treasury or allocated for other legitimate and needed purposes. The IG will need to investigate allegations that high officials fled with hundreds of millions of U.S. dollars in cash and we're told that one of those was the former president, the most recent president of Afghanistan, got away with millions and millions of dollars. Now, if true, this would be more proof of systemic corruption that was the country's undoing. Stolen tax dollars should be recovered. The House Defense Authorization Bill already instructs Seaguard to address these and other issues. I call on the Senate Armed Services Committee to adopt those same measures and authorize funding needed to finish the job by CIGAR. Congress needs to know why CIGAR's alarm bells on poor scrutiny, security, corruption, waste were largely ignored. They were un unmistakable indicators of the impending collapse that we now know has happened to the country of Afghanistan to the Taliban. Once the decision was made to pull out U.S. troops in early 2020, preparations for evac evacuations were mandatory. So then why did our president make such a panicked and haphazard exit? Did no one see the warnings coming? 
and the signs that showed what would happen? Did the military fail to develop an orderly exit strategy and evacuation, ev evacuation plan as alleged by Secretary Blinken? If true, who was responsible for that blunder? As congressional autopsy might help us avoid the same mistakes in the future, it might help us put forward a better foot to strengthen strategic alliances. As painful as it may be, we must never give up trying to learn from our past mistakes. We still face threats from terrorist groups with the same ideology that the 9-11 attackers have, and you know where they got their uh, uh, training in Afghanistan. We still have troops in many countries combating terrorism in partnership with local forces. We can't afford to sweep mistakes under the rug and just move on and forget about it. Without some soul searching, America risks further humiliation, humiliations like we have just witnessed, which will only embolden our would-be adversaries. <laughs>